I love the series that you're in right now, this idea of summer uh, songs. And so what it makes me think of, uh, it makes me think of sort of like summertime, blockbuster hits. Is anybody excited to go see some movies this summer? Some of y'all, I know you're probably in a church, y'all are not allowed to go see movies. Um, <laughs> but you're not gonna tell anybody, but you're gonna go see some movies this summer, more than likely. More than likely you remember uh, some, some, maybe some, blockbuster movies that you watched sort of growing up. Let me tell you a funny story. Last year, our church, we were meeting in an AMC theater. And uh, last summer, I got to preach the entire summer right next to Top Gun 2. It was right ne- in the theater right next to us. Jets are roaring. Sometimes at the most inopportune moments of the message, we were taking it down, you know, real, real slow jam moment. And, you know, so... Uh, but maybe for you, you think about summer blockbuster movies. Maybe you're like me, and, and it's not the movies that you think of, but you think of like summertime jams, like hits. You, you think of songs. Here's what I love about music. Uh, a certain chord, a certain melody, actually has the ability to transport you through time. Is there anybody here that you remember you've had a moment where you've heard a song, and it took you back It took you back in time and you remember everything sort of that was going on. You remember the feelings. You ever have a song give you a smell? You ever hear a song and now your other sense kicked in and you could smell cool breeze, you could could smell summer air, you could smell her perfume? Come on, somebody. (laughs) Songs have the ability to do that. And what I want us to understand is that in the scriptures, God's not immune to that. God God knows how he wired us and how he built us. And in the middle of our scriptures, we have the Psalms. We have a collection of melodies. We have a collection of poetry. We have a collection of reflection and, and hearts being poured out. And the Psalms for the church historically, throughout the centuries, have been the place that the people of God go to learn how to pray, to learn how to worship, to learn how to encounter God in and through their emotions. Here's one of the things I want you to be real clear about and understand and embrace this fully. God gave you all of the emotions that you have. And I heard one real, real wise person say this before, that for every emotion and circumstance that you have in life, there is a psalm to go with it. Everything that we're going to encounter, we can find the psalms giving us a sense of peace, a sense of security, a sense of direction. Let me just give you a quick word. This isn't even in the notes, this is just extra, about your emotions. Don't trust them things. (laughs) We've graduated hopefully beyond the place that our emotions are driving the vehicle. Have your emotions, but they're not the vehicle, they're the road signs. Your emotions are telling you things and God's given them to you, but do not be driven by your emotions. There are gonna be moments where you're gonna wake up and you're like, man, I don't really feel, and you can fill in the blank. Don't quit your job just because you don't feel like going to work. That's a real practical message for somebody to put into practice tomorrow. (laughs) You're gonna wake up and it's Monday and you're like, man, I hate this job. But you need that job. Can I give you some good wisdom? The best time to look for a job, you know what that is? When you have a job. Don't go quitting before you've accepted another job. That's just the word from the Lord. Take that today. Turn your Bibles with me to Psalm chapter 91. We're going to take a psalm. We're going we're to read it. We're going to consider it today. I think it's got something to say to us and for us. Are you ready for God's word? Psalm 91, it says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions. Under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrows that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but you will not, but it will not come near you. 
You and you will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. The most high who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. And on their hands they will bear you up. Lest you strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and on the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample under your foot. Verse 14 and 16. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. Here this is God's promise. Because he, you and I, hold fast to him in love, he will deliver us. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. And I will be with him in trouble. And I will rescue him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Let's bow our heads and our hearts today. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you. We thank you for your word. It is indeed a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path. So God, we pray now in the next few moments you would open our ears to hear thy grace, that you would tune our hearts to hear the melody of heaven. We don't have to leave this place today the same as we walked in. And so what we need is the spirit of God to speak to us deep unto deep. Lord, use me if you can. And if you can, in spite of me, Holy Spirit, move among your people. Minister to your people. God, for that, we'll be quick to give you the praise now and forevermore. And all God's people said, amen. If you look at the psalm that precedes this one, Psalm chapter 90, it, it seems to speak of the, the brevity and the devastation that happens in life. But psalm 91 wa- wants us to be very, very clear that when you and I, when we dwell in the presence of God, that there is a protection, there is a comfort. If you were to read Psalm 90 and then Psalm 91, you, you might, if you were cynical in nature or even critical in your mind, you might say something like this. Those passages of scripture seem to me that they're contradicting one another. And I wanna invite you into this, this space of tension. Not contradiction, but tension, because you and I know this, that life is complex. You know, one of the things that I can't stand is when someone will try to simplify very, very profound feelings and emotions and experiences in your life. Have you ever been through something and you were pouring your heart out to someone and your pouring your heart out was like minutes in nature and their response was like a quick tweet or thread? You ever have a moment where you're talking to someone and they're like, oh, tr- trust God. Thanks, dummy. I know trust God. What I needed was something a little bit more. Psalm 90 and Psalm 91 seem as if they might be at odds, but I would obviously, I would offer you this morning that I don't think they're at odds at all. I think they're at tension. One of the beautiful things about music and melody, you're not playing sometimes when you create chords, you're not playing the same exact note over and over again, but there's a collection of chords that bring the sound Some of us, if we're not careful, we've been thinking that the sound and the melody of the spirit was only supposed to be one thing, when actually what we're experiencing in our life is a myriad of experiences and emotions, and what God says to his children and his people here, that if you will find yourself in me, there's invitations for us in this passage of scripture. If you were to break out in the text, there, there's three invitations. One is the invitation to God's presence. The second is an invitation into God's protection. And then third, there's this invitation into God's promise. An invitation, I, I love that thought. I, I've been considering that for a while now, that when the, when the spirit nudges us, when, when God sort of, sort of calls out to us, even in moments of rebuke, I know some of you here in the, in the room, and you're maybe new to faith, but some of you are, are older in the faith, and, and you know about a good rebuke from the Lord. <laughs> Ever have the Holy Spirit just sort of get in your car and say something to you? And if you were younger, it would have hurt your feelings. <laughs> but now, is there anybody in the room that just loves a good rebuke from the Lord? Am I the only one? <laughs> Sometimes I like to go to church and get yelled at still. I'm just not going to lie to you. 
tell me I'm not so good. Like, I, sometimes I want that. But, but what the Spirit of God's been sort of dealing with me in my heart with, just sort of personally, if I could share this with you, is that even the rebukes of the Spirit are an invitation. I don't know about you, but I like to be invited. Man, if you're having a party, invite me. I'm not gonna lie to you, I am a party. If I show up, we're gonna have a good time. I love what he said about kitchen rights. Even if he didn't give me kitchen rights, if I come to your house, I'm gonna get some orange juice. I'm going straight for that expensive thing. Drinking your orange juice. And if it's concentrate, I'm gonna judge you. That's just the real, real situation here. I grew up having to add water to, uh, to orange juice. Anybody else in the room? Now, here's how I know in life that I've made it. We buy simply orange in my house. We pour straight from that. My youngest son, Declan, though, thinks that stuff is free. And so at every opportunity, that kitchen door is open. And he's just pouring out. And how many know that Declan likes to pour out a little for the homies at the end of his meal? What I mean by that is he don't drink everything that puts in his cup. And I'm at the age now, I start calculating the amount of dollars and cents that boy's wasting. But if I come to your house, I'm going straight for the orange juice. I like to be invited, but I'm also the age right now in life. Do you know what I'm going to do with that invitation? I'm not always going to come. When you're younger, we wanted to be invited because we were going to show up to everything. The older you get, and you get to be my age, little white in your beard, you're offended if you don't get invited. But just because you invite me don't mean I'm coming. That's just a word to anybody else. If you invite me to your wedding, I ain't coming. I've been to all the weddings I'm going to. I got three more weddings that I'm going to. One of them I'm going to pay for. That's it. There's only been in, in, my, in my life, listen, the last 21 years I've been married, not counting my, my wedding, there's only been three weddings that I've stayed the entire time. I'm doing a wedding for somebody in our church a few weeks ago. They're, they're very excited. I'm excited for them to get married. I remember how fun that is. And I told them straight up, I'm going to perform the ceremony. And then I'm out. <laughs> I love you. This stuff. Oh, but pastor, we're going to have great food and we want you to be part of it. I'm sure you are. Sure you are, but I'm rolling my Chick-fil-A on the way home and I'm gonna be excited about those 12 nuggets and that lemonade. An invitation, an invitation says come, stay a while. An invitation says, hey man, you, I want you to be a part of this. Can I, also, can I also offer this to you today? Sometimes the invitation of the Lord isn't to just show up to a place. Sometimes the invitation of the Lord is, is to let, let go of some things. Yeah, that's good. You see, sometimes the invitation of God is, is getting us out of the places and the positions that we've gotten ourselves into. Anybody in the room grateful for the grace of God that gets you out of situations that you got yourself into in the first place? So as we consider the text, if you're taking notes, there's a couple things that I, I want to highlight for you. And if you're writing it down, maybe you'll write it down simply like this. The first one is this, come and sit and stay a while. If I'm titling the message, that's what I would title it. Come sit and stay a while. I can hear my grandmother's voice as I, as I say that. I come in the house and have my shoes still on, maybe backpack on or, or whatever. And I come in and my Mimi would always say to me, say, hey, come sit and stay a while. In other words, what she's saying is there's an invitation, and the invitation is I want you to come be present. I want you to come sit down. I want you to come enjoy where you're at. What the scripture says here, and what it talks about, that word you saw, dwell. It says, I want you to dwell. And here's what it means. Psalms 90 encourages the hearers that to consciously find their rest and security in God. And then Psalm 91, what we read, responds with a determined declaration to do just that it's one thing for you and I to know that dwelling in the presence of God is a good idea. It's something altogether different when we make the decision and the declaration in our life that we're going to dwell in the presence of God. We're making that decision. We're declaring it with our mouths and we're demonstrating in our lives. Can I just say this to you? A lot of people are really good about saying stuff to God. But what is required of us is that we declare and we also demonstrate. Audit in your life right now, where is your consistency in those things? Do you say and do or are you just a bunch of talk? But there's also a danger on the other side of this. Maybe you're doing but you're not declaring. Some of you have known God for a long time and you've been faithful to God's house 
and you show up week in and week out, you serve, you do all these things, but the one thing that you don't do is declare the faithfulness of God in the city in which you live. I don't know who this is for, but some of you this week, man, you need to tell the story of what God has done in your life to people that you come in contact with. Now listen to me, don't be a weirdo. But but do it from a place of of, of genuine, you and I both know when people are faking it. How how are you doing that? I'm blessed and highly favored. Then get out of here. Be, be able to be authentic and real. I, I want you to think about dwelling in, in this sense. And as I was thinking about this, there, there are visitors. The visitors are people that come by every now and then. It's good to visit, isn't it? Good to come by, say what's up. Good to steal a good meal. Good to grab a glass of orange juice from your neighbor. <laughs> Visiting's great. And you have visiting, and, and then you also have neighbors. Neighbors are, are in closer proximity, aren't they? Visitors might live somewhere else and then they come, but a neighbor kind of lives close in proximity. But neighbor, that's not what God asks us to be. He doesn't ask us to be a visitor. He doesn't ask us to be a neighbor. He asks us to be a resident in his presence. And what's the distinction and the difference? To be a resident in God's presence means that my address is the presence of God. Let me help you. This morning, some of you, you have made your address your pain. You've made the address of your life what happened to you in the past. Rather than that, what God is inviting us to is to change our address and allow the address of our life and our soul to be rooted in the presence of God. He says, I want you to dwell in the presence of God. I want you to abide. And that immediately begins me to think about John chapter 15, verse 4. The scripture will be here and what we'll look at it. But he says this. This is Jesus' words. Listen to the invitation. He says, abide in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear much fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do, what does it say? Nothing. Can I just confess to you that there's been moments and seasons of my life that I've tried to do things for God without abiding in God? And can I just tell you that those seasons are tiresome? Maybe the invitation for some of you is to abide, it is to dwell, it is to find your identity and your purpose through the lens of who Jesus is. Because to accomplish the purpose and the plan that God has for your life apart from him, The scripture says that we won't bear fruit. The scripture says that we don't have the ability to produce the thing that God has designed us to produce. Apart from him, we can do nothing. The ideas of dwelling and resting that we see in the text have these sort of undertones that it is going to be consistently done and it is going to be permanently done. God's invitation to dwell in his presence is not come by if you feel like it. We can be here all afternoon, so if you're not busy, come on through. We've all given that invitation out to friends, haven't we? Hey, I'm throwing something on the grill. If y'all want to come through, that's great. Grab ice before you come over. That is not the invitation that God gives us. He says, I want you to dwell. I want you to be there consistently. I want you to be there with an attitude of permanence. The second thing I want us to consider as we we think about this text, it's really a question. Do you focus on where or who? You see, the Bible talks about dwelling, and in the dwelling and in the abiding in God, there is a benefit and a byproduct that is rest. So when you and I, when we think about rest, do we think about it as a where or do we think about it as a who? I heard this phrase a few weeks ago, and and I love it. God was kind of talking about how he was meeting with the counselor and the counselor was sort of helping him sort of unplug, sort of unwind. He had been in a really sort of heightened state state of of a lot of adrenaline, uh, a lot of productivity, and he was actually needing to get his body to a place of, of sort of rest. He was learning how to rest. Now, I know this isn't for anybody in this room. All of you here probably just kill it when it comes to rest. But maybe you can say this for your neighbor. This point might be for your neighbor. 
He, he, says, he says to him, and I love this question. He said, where are you toes in the sand? He said, where in your life are you toes in the sand? And toes in the sand means completely unplugged. You're able to be at rest. He says, so what is that? And so he starts giving some examples and he starts talking and, and as a good counselor, the counselor begins to sort of poke on some of the things that he says because they're sort of those contrite answers. Oh, when I'm with my family, it's toes in the sand. Not always. You got a teenager in your house? Sometimes those teenagers aren't toes in the sand. Can I get an amen from the church? Any teenager in the room that would say, hey, when you're around your parents, not always toes in the sand. Easy, Caden. He says, toes in the sand is this place where you can be you, free from expectation, free from demands, a sense where you can relax. And the challenge is this, you and I realize that in our life, we have to get rest in physical area of our life. We have to get rest in mental spaces, emotional spaces in our life, relational spaces. Some of you right now, you're so fatigued and tired because you're around people all of the time. And sometimes you're around people all the time because you are not willing to be with God alone. Because the moment you enter into a place of silence, you enter into a place of solitude, all the stuff flies to the front of the car. And you're, you're not equipped or ready to deal with that. And I just want to call attention to that because there's an invitation for you to dwell in the presence of God, to abide in him, and begin to learn how toes in the sand isn't just a place, but it's actually a person. Right. Toes in the sand, friend, for us is found in Jesus. The writer of Hebrews says it this way, that there is for God's people another type of rest that we can enter into. One of the commandments that goes sort of overlooked time and time again is the command for us to Sabbath, to rest. God built it in. God went to work for six days, and then he takes a day off. He rests. And here's the beautiful thing. The very next week starts what? Not from a place of work and productivity, but it starts from a place of rest. Some of you, in your work, you've lost that edge, you've lost that tenacity, and some of it isn't because your skills are becoming outdated, it's just because your soul hasn't rested in a while. Some of your marriages, what you need is not a divorce, you need a Sabbath. You need a rest. You need to stop striving, cease from, from productivity, and in your resting, what you are acknowledging to God is, I am not you. There's always gonna be things on the to-do list. There's always gonna be other hills and mountains to climb. Sabbath is a discipline and it restrains us. Why? Because without it, we burn out. Without it, sin is crouching at our doors. You know that it's easy for you and I to step out of bounds with God when we're fatigued? Also when we're hungry, when you're hangry. Some of y'all know what that means. My wife gets hangry, can see it coming. I'm like, baby, we're gonna get you a snack. We're gonna get you one right now. And God's inviting us into a place of rest, into a Sabbath. And so the question to ask and to consider for yourself this morning is have you turned this idea of rest as into a place, meaning, and some of you have been saying this, man, if we can just get to this vacation spot, man, it's gonna make everything all right. Some of you have found this, right? You've gone on vacation and you came back more exhausted than when you left. <laughs> or some of you, you get to a place and it's a time and a season to rest and you're not able actually to rest because you don't know how to unwind and here's the trick. God has prescribed for us and commanded us in his word to weekly learn how to rest. You say, Charlie, I don't know if I can do that in my life. I don't know if my finances can afford that. I don't know if my job will allow it. And, and listen to me, I, I love you. I love you. I've been here a few times now. Love you. Hear me on this. You either believe God's word or you don't. And for some of us, we would love to go to the ends of the world to prove our devotion. 
but we don't want to exercise restraint to demonstrate our devotion and our decision to dwell in the presence of God. And so again, is, is it a place, when you think about rest, think about this, immediately when you think about rest, did you think about a place, an activity, a thing, or, or did you think about a person that Jesus desires to give you his rest? He says, are you weary? He says, are, are, you, are you heavy laden? Are you carry, carrying burdens that are too much for you? One of the lies that the enemy sort of permeates in, in environments like this is that you've gotta have it all figured out before you come to God. And Jesus' word says, listen, if you're broken, if you're tired, he said, why don't you come on that way? He said, to make this exchange and allow your life to take on my yoke. Here's a phrase that we use in our church and in our life a lot. Man, we want to operate at the grace and the pace of Jesus. Here's a question for you. Are you weary because you're carrying a burden that God didn't ask you to? Are you tired because you haven't rested in the way in God, which God has designed for you to? And are you trying to operate at a grace and a pace that is not Jesus? He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Friends, one of the prayers that I pray every morning as I'm starting my day is, God, let me not carry anything that is not you. And then God, give me the courage, the strength, the internal fortitude to lay down the stuff that I've been carrying and calling it yours. Where is that place of rest? Is it a, is it a place or is it a person? The third thing I want you to write down is, is this. God's word remains true throughout the generations. I, I love how this psalm ends with these promises, and, and it shifts the way in which we read it. It shifts from, from then becoming almost this divine oracle where God is saying, Here, here's the promise, and, and I want you to take hold of this, and I want you to, to know. And it says here, I, I just, these are three things I want to sort of grab as subpoints on this today. You and I have to pass on the promises of God. I love in the New Testament, Paul says things like this. He says, what I've received, I pass on. What I've received, I pass on. So think about this. What have you received from God? What blessings, what grace, what miracle has God done in your life? Then you, your responsibility is to pass that on. That happens this way. I'm going to tell the story. I'm going to testify to what God has done. And I'm going to keep it moving. Some of you have a great heritage in the faith. Some of you look down and you're similar to me, you look down your family tree and it's just a bunch of church folks. And listen, church folks also can fight in the streets, right? So let's just be honest. But the heritage in my, in my family, I'm grateful for it. My grandmother is, is getting up in age and so she's in her 90s now and so there's not any time that I spend time with my Mimi where she doesn't say this, hey, if it wasn't for me, none of y'all be in church. I was like, maybe I think the family tree was before you, but all right, I get it. You're taking credit. Praise God. I have a heritage, and I'm grateful for it. My kids are going to have that heritage. My, I'm going to pass this on to my kids. But some of you in the room, you don't got a heritage in the faith. It's starting with you. You're like, ain't nobody in my family saved. You're like, honestly, it'd be a miracle if they showed up in this place. And what if the miracle of them showing up in this place comes as a byproduct of your willingness to pass on what God has done in you? So it's got to start somewhere. So listen, we've got to pass this word on. It doesn't just happen. It's got to be given. We, we pass it on. And you also can't give away what you don't have. You find it hard to testifying to the goodness of God. Maybe you're not living in relationship with God like you thought you were. Because when I'm talking about testifying and passing on, it's not a head knowledge of God. I do not want to be a person that has just studied God theologically and looked at God academically and not had any encounter with God on a personal level. I don't ever want to preach as a professor. Yes, I want to study. Yes, I want to show myself approved. Yes, I want to have all those intellectual sort of wrestlings with the text. Please don't hear me not saying that. 
But I do not want to turn God's word just into some sort of classroom and experiment. We're called to encounter and experience. You and I, we've got to pass this on. It's got to start somewhere. And so if you don't have a heritage, that means it's starting with you. Some of you need to hear this today. You need to step up into that place. You're not a victim anymore. You're not damaged goods. You've been bought and paid for with a price. And stop allowing the enemy to to overwhelm your mind and rip you away from dwelling in the presence of God just because you're the first person in your family to get there. You might be the first, but you won't be the last. Come on, can I get an amen for that? And the third thing I want us to see in this, and this is important for us as we pass on, is don't quote the scriptures like the devil. Don't quote the scriptures like the devil. For some of you in the room, if you know your Bible as well, you know that in Matthew chapter four, and in Luke, roughly chapter four, Jesus is tempted by the devil. The the key point to understanding this is that the spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness to then be tempted by the devil. Now some of our theology don't have space for that. Because like God would never put me in a position, would he? God will never put you in a position that he's not prepared you for or provided you a way out of, but don't live in this fantasy world that God will not test you in your devotion. Because those of us that have bought the lie that God doesn't do that, the moment that testing comes, we run away. And the moment that testing comes, we go, oh, the scriptures must have just been hyperbolic. It may not be a real word, it may not be accurate, it may not be true, it may not be something I could take literally or literarily, but I have to just... Now, it's gotten tough, so I've got to back out of this. When the scripture says that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness, and the enemy takes him up, and you can see this in Matthew uh, chapter 4, we'll read this. It says, the devil then took him up to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and he said to them, verse 5 and 6, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands he will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. The devil is using Psalm 91 in the temptation of Jesus. And let's be honest, it seems at a cursory reading that he's quoting it correctly. Psalm 91 is provision. Psalm 91 is is protection. But what Jesus responds to the enemy is, is, is beautiful. He uses Deuteronomy chapter six in his response. In the broad context of that passage, revolves around the challenge to love God above all else. And the particular expression of devotion to him should be displayed in trusting him, listen to this, even when circumstances don't look good. So hear me on this. Psalm 91 doesn't mean that bad things will not happen to God's people. Psalm 91 does not mean that you and I will not face the attack of the enemy. What Psalms 91 should be considered always in light of the interaction that Jesus has with the enemy. Why? Because Jesus provides us with the exemplar, if you will, interpretation and application. Another thing that we can look at that sort of gives us the same sort of rhythm is you remember the story in the Old Testament. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three Hebrew men of faith, young guys. Nebuchadnezzar's building idols and requiring for people to worship. And here's what they say to him. They said, oh king, we're not bowing before you. He says, listen, if you don't bow before me, I'm gonna throw y'all into the furnace. Death is imminent. Punishment is imminent. And I don't know if you've ever talked about or thought about the ways in which you want to die, but one of the top ones on my list of ways in which I do not want to die is being burnt alive. See, also followed by drowning, also followed by falling downstairs. Those are my top three in case you're wondering. I'm not built for falling downstairs. He says, listen, if you don't bow down, surely you will die. And here's how they respond. And it's in light of what Jesus says, it's connected there, and it's the heart of Psalm 91. He says, our God can save us. That's sort of faith. That says, I'm facing this, but our God can save us. 
Surely he's mighty. Surely he's able. Our God can save us. And here is the crux of it all. Here's where mature faith sort of emerges in what you and I should aspire to. Our God can save us, but even if he doesn't, we won't bow. Even if he doesn't, we won't bow. And if you know the story, here's the beauty in this. They got to a place where they declared their allegiance and their devotion to God. They said, God, you can do it. But if you don't, we're still yours. We're still going to dwell. We're still going to be in your presence. We're still going to abide. We're still going to pass this on. So Nebuchadnezzar throws him in the fire. And he looks into the fire. And he says, didn't we? He said, I, man, I thought we, there was three of them, right? There was... We threw three in, but there's four in there. We, we, we threw three in there, but there's four. You see, here's the, and he says, and the fourth one looks like the son of man. Can I leave you with this thought today, Crossroads Church? When we have a faith that is rooted in the person and in the presence of God, we say things like, I believe, and even if, and our God comes through and will dance with us in the midst of the flames. Didn't we sing that this morning, church? He's been my fourth man in the fire. Church, would you bow your heads? Would you pray with me? Father, we love you. We're grateful, God, for your goodness. Grateful, God, for your mercy. I'm gonna ask you just for a moment of vulnerability. Are you in the room? And you'd say, Charlie, I want to dwell in the presence of God. I don't wanna be a visitor. I don't wanna be a neighbor. I want my address to be in the presence of God permanently. If that's you, no heads, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, I want you to lift your hand right in this moment. I wanna pray with you. Hands are going up in every section, every section. Father, you see your people and you know their heart. Now God, I pray that you would grace them with your presence, that you would grace them, God, with just a lift of the Holy Spirit. And God, may they make the hard decisions. May they have the discipline not to remain in your presence all the days of their life. And it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen.